water in the air. Another day is breaking. Yesterday is gone and the light of dawn holds new beginnings. The day is sounding. Singing a new song. Hear the angels echo. We are love beyond. Beyond the raging sea. You're the life inside of me. I lift my hands and I rejoice. There's a reason now to come alive. Let's come alive. A broken heart, repair the parts and keep it beating. Can you feel the mountain tremble at his name? Hear the angels echo. We are love beyond, beyond the raging sea. You're the life inside of me. Higher, my savior, redeemer, you're reaching for me. And your mercy, your power, your love takes us higher. My savior, redeemer, you're reaching for me. Rejoice, there's a reason now to come alive. Let's come alive. Rejoice, for hope it starts a fire in us. Please take your seats. Thank you. Good morning, beloved church family, and a warm welcome to our first Sunday service in the month of May. It is really good to see you all, and a joy and a blessing it is to worship with you, the Lord, in the house of God. Um, if you've joined us for the first time, we are really happy to see you. Welcome. A warm welcome also to our friends following us on various platforms. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. If you are watching us online, we would love to hear from you. Therefore, please feel free to use our platform. Post your comments, feedbacks, questions, if you have any. Praise the Lord. Our weekly activities continue online and by phone as usual. Online Bible studies, uh, prayer meetings, all details in the weekly newsletter. If you are not already on our emailing list, please make sure you get on it so you will receive the weekly updates. Please don't forget to book your seat as we are still um, observing the COVID regulations. And there are only limited numbers of seats available every week for you. Later on, Andrea will be bringing us God's word. Uh, she will be preaching in, um, on finding joy in Jesus, a word of encouragement um, taken from Philippians 4. Um, let us read our call to worship taken from Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Praise God. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, that your word is ever true. 
and your mercies are new every morning. We rejoice, Lord, that you are the same God and you change not. We are thankful, Lord, because you are a good God and all your promises are yes and amen. Nothing is too difficult and nothing is impossible to you. Let your word renew our mind and heart, Lord, this morning. Help us to align ourselves with your perfect will. Lord, we commit this service into your hands. Have your way among us. As your glory shines upon us, may we not live the same way we came. Open our hearts and minds to receive. As we sit in your presence, may yoke be lifted and chains be broken. As your word goes forth in power, bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name, Son of the living God, we pray. Amen. We will stand again and worship the Lord with two songs. Afterwards, Florence will be praying for us and will um, also give an offering prayer. Please stand to your feet.
Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. I am found. I am yours. I am. Go away.
Good morning, church. Glory to God for another new month. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we give you all the glory, we give you all the praise. We adore you, Lord, because you have been so good to us. You've taken us through four months of this year. You've provided for us, you've given us your peace, you've protected us, you've preserved our lives. Through all the turbulent periods, you've been our God. Father, we give you all the praise, we exalt your name. We say thank you, Lord, because we have lacked nothing, because you are the all-sufficient God. Glory be to you, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Our Lord and our God, even as we come before you this morning to intercede on behalf of our world and ourselves, Father, we want to ask, O oh God, that you forgive us where we've come short of your glory, because you said in your word that if we bear iniquities in our hearts, you are not going to listen to us. So, Father, we ask, O oh God, as we confess in our hearts every sin, O oh God, everywhere where we are falling short of your glory, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your mercy. We ask, O oh Lord, that you continue to give us the grace to amend our sinful ways, to decline from sin, and to be in, inclined to virtue and walk in a perfect heart before you all the days of our lives. Father, Lord God, we want to bring our world before you. Father, our world is in trouble. Lord, even as your coming is drawing close, we can see your, your, your word is living out in, in our midst, everything that has been written in it. Father, Lord God, there's been rumors of war and there's war. My Father and my God, there's been a lot of disasters, like we just heard about from Israel. Father, Lord God, diseases are increasing, like we know about India. My Father and my God, there's persecution. People don't want to hear your word again. My Lord and my God, there's a lot of atrocities going on in this world. Who will deliver us? It is only you, Lord. That is why we are even thanking you for the joy of salvation, for, for our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you have sent to deliver us and to save us from sin, so that all these disasters will not be our portion, and that when you come back, you will meet us in a heart that is pleasing to you. My Father and my God, have mercy on our world. Father, send help to India, O oh Lord. Father, touch the hearts of nations that are rich and have all these resources that they require. They need gas, oxygen. Father, they need medication, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Father, have mercy. Have mercy, O oh God. Stop the hand of death over this nation in the mighty name of Jesus. My Lord and my God, comfort your people in Israel who have lost relations during this last stampede. My Father and my God, I pray, O oh God, that you teach the leaders, O oh God, when occasions like this are coming, how to make the people safe in all the, the activities that they will be carrying out. My Lord and my Heavenly Father, I pray, O oh God, for areas of the world where because of economic Problem, oh God, there is famine, oh God, Father, Lord God, a lot of people are hungry, a lot of people have no jobs, Lord. Father, we just ask for your mercy. There's nothing else we can ask for but mercy, because your mercy pre prevails even over judgment. From everlasting to everlasting, your mercy is over us. Father, have mercy. Remember your word, oh God, and keep us, oh God. Return us, oh God, return our hearts to you. Because our hearts are in your hands, O oh God, and you say you can turn it around the way you wish, like a flowing river. Lord, turn our hearts back to you, O oh God, so that you will take all this evil away from us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we come home to our nation here. Lord, we are thanking you for the reduction in, in death rate, O oh God, and even for the, in the infection, O oh God. Father, we thank you for the wisdom that only comes from you that you have given to our leaders, O oh God. And we thank you for giving them the grace, O oh God, to obey, to listen to you. Father, we pray that they continue to seek your face more and more. Father, and while we thank you for this, Lord, we 
also pray, O oh God, that you will, you will deliver us from all evils, O oh God, that are going on in our society. Father, Lord God, children, is sweets are treats to children. We heard in the news yesterday that some, some sweets are being spiked with <laughs> these evil drugs, oh God, that can kill my Lord and my God. Who wants to destroy little children who are just starting their lives? Father, have mercy. Forgive us, oh God, and turn your people's heart to do good and not evil. My Lord and my Heavenly Father, I pray, O oh God, for all our frontline leaders in the hospitals, Father, even on our street, the police, O oh God, Father, Lord God, even we pray, O oh God, for all the people who are, who, who, are remo- who are picking up our rubbish, we pray for your protection. We pray for your love. We pray for your grace over everyone. My Father and my God, we pray, O oh God, that our community leaders, O oh God, we learn from you, O oh God, how to treat people right, O oh God, and how to seek from you, O oh God, what is the need of your people. My Father and my God, we pray concerning the election that is coming on Thursday. Your word says that you, you put leaders over us. Father, Lord God, give us the grace to listen to you, O oh God, and to vote for the right people, O oh God, to take control of our city in these coming years. Father, we pray, O oh God, that you will touch our hearts, O oh God, that we will not judge that things are not going right, therefore we are not going out to vote. Father, help us to go out, O oh God, and help us, O oh God, to do the right thing. My Lord and my Heavenly Father, I come to our church. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for our pastors. Thank you for your watch care, your protection over them. Thank you, my Lord and my God, for your provision for their families. Thank you, God, for wisdom, for, 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 for the way you lead them and you guide them and you give them visions how to lead your church. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you continue, O oh God, to bless our pastors. Thank you for deacons and elders who are supporting, O oh God. My Lord and my God, I pray, O oh God, that you will protect all from this evil, O oh God, that nothing, nothing, O oh God, will be able to disturb your work, O oh God. Thank you for enabling us to be able to come to church in this way. But we pray, O oh God, that very soon, O oh God, very soon, we who are redeemed from this evil, we return, O oh God. We will come back with singing in the, into this church, and everlasting joy shall be upon our head, O oh God. Father, Lord God, we shall, we, we, we shall obtain gladness, we shall obtain joy, and sorrow and weeping shall, be, shall fly away from our midst. We will see each other again, we will be able to hug one another, we will be able to get close to one another, and we'll be able to to know even what are the needs of one another. My Father and my God, thank you even during this lockdown, how you are using our pastors, our leaders, oh God, to, to, to meet the needs of our people who are homebound, who are unable to come to church. Father, we ask, oh God, that you continue to bless your church. We continue to make us to be light in this community where you have located us. Father, we want to ask, O oh God, that you will continue, O oh God, to be with our youth, O oh God. They are our hope for tomorrow. Father, teach them from above, O oh God, and let their peace in you be great. Father, I pray, O oh God, that none of our youth will derail, O oh God. I pray, O oh God, they will bring others who are derailing into your sanctuary and into your salvation, O oh God, that, Lord, the world will become a better place through the holy life that our youth will be living. My Father and my God, I want to pray, O oh God, for all those who have lost loved ones in this past year. I use uh, your daughter, Mrs. Maja, as a point of contact for everyone who's, who, who has lost a loved one in the past one year, as she will be remembering her husband one, one year gone. Father, I pray, O oh God, that you will turn their mourning into dancing again. You will lift their sorrows, O oh God, and you will give them great and mighty testimony through the comfort that you will bring to their hearts. Pray for the sick, Lord. We pray, O oh God, that your mighty healing hand, O oh God, will continue to touch them and make them whole, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we commit the, our worship service today into your hand. Father, be with us and guide us, lead us right, O oh God, as we have started with you from the beginning. Be with us through to the end. 
Give us attentive hearts, O God. Strengthen our minds, O God, that we will listen. Father, Lord God, I pray for your daughter who will be bringing the word to us today. I pray, my Father, that you will fill her with your Holy Spirit, O God, that your word that will come from her will come with power, O God, and it will mingle with faith in our lives, O God, that we will go home, O God, being touched again and being lifted again by your word. Thank you, blessed Father. All glory be to you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. Amen. What a prayer answering God we have. Praise the Lord. Let's continue to pray uh, for our offerings. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you that you can satisfy our every desire and need. We know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills and that the earth is yours in all its fullness. We know that everything is at your disposal and you are not dependent on us. Nevertheless, please receive this humble offering that we give with great delight as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give for the effective growth of your kingdom. May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith so that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. May we be filled with all the fullness of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Next, we are going to have uh, the flags presented by Pastor Stephen, followed by a song, In Christ Alone, and we'll have uh, the reading by Keisha. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. Isn't it difficult singing behind these masks and humming to ourselves? Wouldn't it be great when we can take them off and raise our hands and really praise the Lord? Uh, it's coming, amen? amen? It is coming. Well, we're very thrilled that uh, Andrew has been educating us, but also calling us to prayer for all the nations of the world, most of whom are on the wall there. And today we have a flag. Well, I don't know if anyone can actually recognize this one. Anyone know what that one is? <laughs> it's Belgium, isn't it? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not Belgium. It's the Union flag or the Union Jack. And it is, of course, the national flag of the United Kingdom. And uh, we are united here, aren't we? So let's just say, hooray! hooray. We're a united kingdom. It's so cool because it combines the crosses of the three countries united under one sovereign. The kingdoms of England and Wales, of Scotland and of Northern Ireland. The uh, Irish cross being uh, St. Patrick's cross, the patron saint of Ireland. There we go. You can see the combination of the flags there. Now, the United Kingdom uh, is made up of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and is an island nation in the northwestern part of Europe. England, birthplace of Shakespeare and the Beatles, from the sublime to the ridiculous, is home to the capital, London, a globally in influential center of finance and culture. Uh, England is also site of Neolithic Stonehenge, Bath's Roman Spa, and centuries-old universities at Oxford and Cambridge. Britain uh, is an island country and surrounded by sea, and it gives England a varied climate. Uh, which is rain, and occasionally rain, and sometimes rain, and uh, in the rainy season, more rain. Uh, we never quite know what the weather will be like from one day to the other. One man once said, I'm going to make a prediction. The weather in the UK is going to be unpredictable. And he was right. It is unpredictable. If you've planned a barbecue for Monday, you might want to think again. Um, population, the population, there we go. Good old British weather, winter, summer. <laughs> the population, 68,000 plus a few extras. Uh, Eight million of us in London, all packed in together. 
And the size of the recession caused by the pandemic is unprecedented in modern times. And our national wealth has declined by 9.8% in 2020. The steepest drop since consistent records began in 1948. But we do believe that the data released so far this year shows the economy appears to be strengthening again and we believe that things will pick up. Christianity is the largest religion in this country, though um, I would rather say these days that those figures mask the fact that we've become a pagan nation and many people have turned away from Christ, sadly. But officially, it's the largest religion, followed by, as you can see, Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, Judaism, Buddhism, a whole lot of other things. And uh, we are among the Christians, Anglicans, Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, Pentecostals, so many different, different groups of Christians. We pray that we might one day bind together and change this nation. Amen. The UK landscape is very, very beautiful. It only gives a hint of it, but there's some amazing places in this country. If you can see them through the rain, then it's a great blessing. But of course, they're very beautiful because of the rain, aren't they? And uh, that's wonderful too. Lovely lowlands, wonderful mountains, and so on. Buildings, uh, buildings, all kinds of grand buildings in this country. We have plenty of history. Brighton, the Royal Pavilion. Bristol, uh, there you can see the suspension bridge. Is by Kingdom Brunel, uh, still standing after all these years. London, St. Paul's Cathedral. Glasgow, the Clyde Auditorium. And here's some facts. Uh, London houses more than 8 million citizens who communicate with probably 300 different languages. That's amazing, isn't it? Even in this church, I don't know how many languages we have. Many, many languages. The first postage stamp was the Penny Black, was created in the UK, designed in 1840, featured the head of Queen Victoria, the first postage stamp. Tea is far the most famous drink among Brits. I think that's changing a little bit now, though. Uh, 165 million cups of tea every day. I don't know what you drink in your house, but uh, there we go. Um, the Monument of Stonehenge is claimed to be one of the oldest monuments in the world, and it's believed that it was built in 3000 BC. The modern game of golf was invented in Scotland. Now, when Andrea sent me this uh, PowerPoint, I'd been listening to a quiz the night before that said, everyone thinks it was invented in Scotland, but actually it was invented in China. Uh, but the modern day of golf really is owned by Scotland. And it was created in 1457. And it became so popular that James II had to ban it because it was interfering with the training of his troops. Uh, now you'll see there, there's some, a whole lot of letters there in yellow. I was going to ask my wife to do this bit, but I'm going to attempt this. <laughs> Here we go. Slanfef with Gwyn, Githgoth, Gerrick, Windroff, with Landy, Silly, Which is probably 80% near to what it should sound like. And of course it's uh, a Welsh name. It's a Welsh name of the longest uh, name in this, of any city in the world. And it's in uh, North Wales, and it's a wonderful place to go and visit. Uh, you just thought there were a lot of letters, didn't you? But it's a, a wonderful place. Prayer points, this is what we want to come to, isn't it? So uh, let's just have a look at those for one moment, then, and I'll lead you in prayer for those things. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great nation of the UK that has been through so many phases in its life. We pray especially for revival, revival in this land that would breathe life into dying churches and especially life into hardened and apathetic hearts. We pray, Lord, that you might turn this nation again and Come with the wind of your Holy Spirit that forces people to be on their knees and cry out for your help. We pray for the inner city neighborhoods to be infused with the transforming power of the gospel. 
And we pray for incomers to this nation from other nations to be met with a vibrant Christian witness and a warm welcome. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers for this nation of the UK because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song, as Bridget said now, In Christ Alone. If you want to stand, you can, and we will uh, try and sing this for you. So let's open our hearts. In Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone.
Good morning, church. Good morning to the Facebook viewers and all who, who is um, tuning in. This morning's reading is from Philippians 4, verses 1 to 9. Here starts the reading. Instructions. So then, my brothers and sisters, how dear you are to me and how I miss you. How happy you make me and how proud am I of you. This then, dear brothers and sisters, is how you should stand firm in your life in the Lord. You Rhoda and Synergy, please, I beg you, try to agree as sisters in the Lord. And you too, my faithful partner, I want you to help these women, for they have worked hard with me to spread the gospel, together with Clement with, and all my other fellow workers, whose names are in God's book of the living. May you always be joyful in your union with the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Show a gentle attitude towards everyone. The Lord is coming. Don't worry about anything, but in all your prayers, ask God for what you need. Always ask in him with a thankful heart. And God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds safe in union with Christ Jesus. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, fill your hearts with those things that are good and that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, honorable. Put into practice what you learned and received from me both from my words and from my actions, and God who gives us peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Next we're going to have Andrea sharing the word of God. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Praise be to God. Good morning, everybody. You know that moment when technology decides to not work anymore? I hope I don't need to improvise. Here we go, let us pray. Father, as we are getting ready to open your word, I pray, Father, that you will manifest yourself in our life. I pray that you meet us at the point of our need. I know, Lord, that when you give us your revelation, there is something for each one of us. May we will not take it lightly, Father, but May we will indeed find that hope, that joy, that peace in your word, Father. And Father, as you spoke to me through your word, Father, I pray that you speak to each one of us today, Father. Open our eyes, open our heart, open our mind to be ready to receive, Father. And may, we, may it be, Father, that by the time we go out, we will go more uplifted than when we come in. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. Amen. So when, when I get a passage, the first thing when I start preparing for it, I say, God, speak to me. And while I was studying this passage, actually I had materials for about three sermons. So I will give you some nuggets today, let's say. I tried to compress them in 20 minutes, 25 minutes, as much as I could. And... Um, it's a lot of lessons here. So let's open our heart and, and, and receive what God prepared for us. The book of Philippians is one of, of the most joyful books because it's one, the great theme of this book is the call to rejoice. And I would say a call at this point, not a command, because I don't want to scare you from the beginning, okay? But being a call, wherever we are called to do something, means that 
we have to do something about it in order to happen, isn't it? You are called to do something, so you need to take action. And as much as we would like things to just fall into place by themselves, this doesn't happen. There is a process that needs to take place. And this applies to all areas of our life. So, in order to see an expected result, we have to engage, we have to reason, and eventually we need to take action based on the word of God. So the message today is finding joy in Jesus. We need to take action to find that joy. And I would like to start with a poem. This is a story told about four people named somebody, everybody, anybody, and nobody. There was one important job to be done. Everybody was sure that somebody will do it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry because it, it, because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it. Nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. How many times we find ourselves in this situation? There are many people around, everybody could do the job, but none of us does it. Now when it's about our salvation, we need to take action. Nobody can do it for us. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you want to come with me, you must forget yourself, carry your cross, and follow me. The cross represents different things to different people. Today, I want us to focus on the cross of relationships. What do I mean by this? I mean by our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. Our life is about our relationship with God and relationship with each other. We don't have a doctrine. We don't have a religion. We have a relationship with our God. And the way how Paul is structuring this, uh, this passage is giving us some problems, giving us some solutions, and eventually showing us what is the result if we apply the solution. Now, what is a problem? A problem is a situation or person or thing that needs attention and needs to be dealt with or solved. You cannot solve what you don't understand. If you don't understand what is going on, you cannot solve it. What is the solution? Is constructing a course of action that will transform your current situation into one where your objective has been achieved. You cannot find a solution if you don't want to solve the problem. If you don't want to have the job done, you will just ignore the problem and there will be no solution. And the result has to be something that happens or exists because of something else. Now, how many of you know that, for example, in a job environment, there are people who said, you know what, you gave me the problem, here is the solution, what is the result I don't care about? And it's happening many times. I am paid to give you a solution, but I don't care about the result. Someone else has to deal with it. And eventually you will, you will see that the the, the solution what, which was given doesn't give the result expected. So this is a process and we have to go to it through the end. And here we go into our uh, passage for today. I will go verse by verse so we'll, you will know exactly when I get to the end of it. So then my friends, how dear you are to me and how I miss you. How happy you make me and how proud I am of you. This, dear friend, is how you should stand firm in your life in the Lord. Well, when someone starts talking like this, will you believe that it's coming a problem to deal with after? And here verse 2. Yudia and Sintiki, please, I beg you, try to agree a sister in the Lord. Now, what is the problem here? Looks like we have here two sisters 
who they don't agree with each other. I know it doesn't happen in this church. However, let's just look into it just in case, okay? How, what is a disagreement? It's something that my way, your way. It's an argument or a situation in which people do not have the same opinion. But there can be many reasons to disagreement, and you cannot close your eyes for a disagreement. Now, when I was, I was studying and I was thinking about disagreement, I was thinking, okay, in this lockdown, I don't even have people to disagree with because uh, me and Bridget, we are, we are sharing the same house and sometimes we don't even see each other a full day. So you cannot really disagree. But if me and Bridget disagree, you don't want to be around. We had once a disagreement and our flatmate was present and we were having a disagreement. So we were telling each other what we had to tell to each other. At the end, we sorted the problem and we went out for shopping. When we came back home, our flatmate was crying and we were asking her, what's your problem? She said, I don't want you to fight. But we, we already sorted our disagreement. This is why our friendship is so good because we sort out our disagreement. You don't want to be around when we do it, but we do it. And this is what is happening in the church as well. You have to express yourself, but sort out your disagreement. Don't just, just leave it pass on and build on it and then something else is coming up on it and so on and so on and so on. Try to sort out your disagreement. And in order to, to sort out the disagreement, we need to know what are the causes of a disagreement because there can many variable causes. For example, facts. People have access to different information or values. People value and care about different things. Or signaling. Sometimes people disagree merely to signal information to others. I like you, I will agree with you. I don't like you, straight away I disagree with you. Or there is failure to logic. If the people on or both sides of argument are engaging in logical misconceptions or other failures of reasoning, they may end up disagreeing as a result. Or competition. Sometimes this agreement is simply about scoring points for our side at the expense of the other side. I am right, you are not, this is my way, that's your way. Or it can be default beliefs or self-interest and pride. There can be different reasons of disagreement, so we have to find out what are the reasons, what is the cause. Now, if you will go your way, if I do my way, I will just go in circles. There is no exit out of it, because there is no solution. I will just do it my way and nothing will happen. The only way out is God's way. And whatever the cause of disagreement is, the Bible tells us that we cannot come before God while we have these kind of issues. In Matthew 5, 23, 24, we, we read, so if you are about to offer your gift to God at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go at once and make peace with your brother, and then come back and offer your gift to God. Paul gives us a solution. And you too, my faithful partner, I want you to help this woman, for they have worked hard with me to spread the gospel, together with Clement and all my other fellow workers whose names are in God's book of life. So what solution is here proposed? to be helped by a fellow Christian. And how does the church is motivated to solve this problem? The women are described, they are very active in the church. But we just read previously that they are active in the church, however they are having disagreements. So what God is telling us, is telling us sort out your disagreement and then come your gift and, and serve me. And the motivation here is a healthy church with healthy relationships, a church that lives for God. A healthy church has a big heart. 
How can we preach the gospel of the love of God if we don't practice the love of God? How can we come to church and I will sit that corner because my sister is sitting in that corner and I don't want to talk to her? How can we do this? John 17, 22, 23 says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me, loved them even as you have loved me. So by loving one another, we make the invisible God visible. Spiritual instability leads to doubt, discouragement, and disappointment, while unity among the Christians proves the authenticity, the reliability of the Christian message. Unity in love makes us rejoice in our relationship with God and each other. And what is the result if we love each other, if we are united in Christ? May you always be joyful in union with the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Show a gentle attitude toward everyone. The Lord is coming soon. Joy is a personal choice to react or to respond to life uncertainties by faith. Now, I want to ask you a question. Were you ever hurt by a church member? Did anyone upset you in the church? Did you ever have an argument with someone in the church? I can tell you, I became a Christian when I was 13, and I was baptized at 14. By the time I get 24, because of some people in the church, I left the church. I didn't want to go to church anymore because I said, you know what, if I have to go to stay with hypocrites as, my, as well, I can stay in the world. And it took God 10 years to get me back. 10 years I was out of the church because someone in the church hurt me. And the person didn't even speak directly with me. I heard that people, a person speak to someone else. But you know what? Now you can say anything you want about me. I will not leave my church. I will not do it anymore because now I am mature. Now I know what it means to be in the church, to be out of the church, and, and I don't want to lose the joy again. I don't want to lose the joy of my salvation. And I want God to be happy with me. I am not perfect, and believe me, there is not a perfect church. If you find one, don't go there because you spoil it, because you are not perfect too. So we have to accept we are not perfect, but in unity with Christ, we can do it. We can do it together. But, and remember, Jesus never said, follow your pastor, follow your deacon, follow your church, follow prophets, or follow whoever. Jesus said, follow me. And you, if you are coming for, to the church to get the blessing, that's the wrong approach as well. Come to the church to be a blessing. Because the gifts that are given to us are to serve. And when you start serving, you will find the joy. Because we were created to serve. If you are coming and you do nothing, you are not fulfilling your purpose. It's like you take the latest iPhone and you try to hoover with it. We were created for unity in Christ and to serve together. We have to fulfill our purpose to find joy. And if you are struggling with rejoicing in the Lord, the answer is not to seek an experience. Many people, they go to church because that pastor speaks this, or do that, or the worship is this, or the worship is that. You are seeking an experience. Rejoicing in the Lord is not an experience. The answer is found in asking the Lord himself to open your heart and your life to joy. Ask Jesus to teach you to rejoice in him. This is not some magic or spiritual bonus, but our heritage of joy in a growing relationship with our Lord. You cannot rejoice and have an offensive attitude. When you are happy, you address other people with a kind attitude, isn't it? If you are happy, you will not start to be rude to people. 
When you rejoice in the Lord, you see the world in a different, with a, from a different perspective. And you know what? Zephaniah 3.17 says this. The Lord our God is with you. His power gives you victory. The Lord will take delight in you, and in his love, he will give you new life. He will sing and be joyful over you. God rejoices over us and wants us to find joy in our daily walk with him. So the first problem is disagreement. The solution given is mediation, reconciliation, and the result will be joy. Isn't it to come to church and to just want to hug everybody when this will be again possible? Because you are rejoicing to see your brothers and sisters. You are not hiding because you don't want to speak to someone. How do you want to feel when you go into a place? You want to feel isolated or to isolate yourself or to feel that you are part of something bigger? Don't worry about anything. What is worry? How many of us knows how to worry? Because I don't want to skip, speak about something that we don't know what we are talking about, isn't it? Did someone need to teach you to, to learn how to worry? Or it just work out for yourself? Worrying is a form of thinking about the future that defined as thinking about future events in a way that leaves you feeling anxious or apprehensive. Worry is a thief. It steals our confidence, our hope, our courage, our joy, and is not coming just one time. It's coming back again and again and again for long periods of time. Sometimes we worry about supposed dangers while we ignore the real dangers in front of us. And worry cannot change the past and cannot control our future. If we cry over the past that cannot be changed, if we stress over the future which hasn't arrived yet, we miss to live in the present. We miss to make life beautiful and enjoy it. Study shows that 40% of our worries never happen. 30% of our worries are concerning the past. 12 of them, 12% 12 of them are totally needless. 10% are ins insignificant. And only 8% of our worries are legitimate concern. We worry about so many things that sometimes are just needless. Lately, I had to look after my, my nephew's children, a five and a seven years old, which is a great challenge, and they have a, a great ability to worry and cry. So I just go around and I see them crying, and I say, now what's your problem? This game is not working properly. And I said, okay, and why do we cry about it? Let's try to sort it out. Or you see them crying and say, why do you cry? Because you give me my toast with butter and jam and I want it separately. And they are worried about it and they are crying about it. Aren't we doing the same? Sometimes we just worry about things just for the sake of worrying. And worry is a mental and a spiritual issue. It's trying to control the uncontrollable. It's playing God taking control over our life, not allowing us to pray to God. Paul says here, don't worry about anything. And this is a command. And says, stop doing it. Why? Because worry makes you a victim. When you are anxious, your mind is divided between legitimate thoughts and destructive thoughts. Your mind, you become a double-minded man. And if you try to find help in the world, 
The very best the world can give you is to manage your anxiety, whereas the Bible has helped us to eliminate it. I don't take lightly this command, and I want to speak especially to those who are anxious and are worrying a lot. I don't say, don't worry, it's a command, you have to do it. I am fully aware that it's not so easy. And I, when I'm telling this, it's because I went through worry and anxiety not once in my lifetime. It was two times that the doctors had to take me on pills because I was so worried, so stressed, and the anxiety was so big that I couldn't breathe anymore. So when I tell you don't do it, it's not that I'm telling you to take it, I'm taking it lightly. I am there with you, I understand you, but what I am I'm trying to, to, to tell you is that there is a solution. In the past two weeks, I struggled quite a lot because in March, I was gifted with a car, and praise God, is like, who gives you a car like that? But my nephew wanted to give me a present. And um, I said, okay, I will take some driving lessons because I learned to drive in Romania, it was a long time ago. And I can tell you, the first day I went out in London to drive, I said, I don't think I can do it. I, I get stuck, my brain gets stuck, I got stuck in traffic, I was so, that fear, that anxiety in me, I couldn't drive. Not because I didn't know what I have to do. When I saw all that traffic and people going everywhere and so on, and the driving instructor decided to take me to Hackney and put me to drive down to Edmonton in full traffic at rush hour. And it was hard. And I said, how, how, how can this be? How can I be a child of God and to battle with this anxiety? Are millions of people driving? How, what is the problem here? But you know what is the worst? The people who love me and they are close to me, they try to encourage me and they made more worse than, than good to me. Because everybody was telling me, come on, you can do it. My nephew, he is like, he was born in the car driving. He was just telling me, come on, you can do it. What you talk about, everybody is driving. So it put me down even more. So I want to give you this advice. When people are worried and anxious, don't take it lightly. They need support. I prayed about it more than two weeks. I took from the Bible all the passages on fear. You have 365, so you can choose whatever you like and you can pray over it. But even in my dream, I was waking up that I am driving and I was anxious. And it took me more than two weeks of prayer, of meditation, of pray people praying over me. And when I went out driving last week, the instructor asked me, what on earth, where you've been up to now? Because I went in center uh, London and it was all the road works and I was just driving the car like all my life I did this. You need help. If you are struggling with worry and anxiety, you need help. If you are online and you need help, please send us a, a message or call the office and during the week, Pastor Stephen, Pastor William can talk to you. You need help. Don't keep it for yourself because our faith levels are different. And I can tell you, if it's not to prepare for this sermon on fear and anxiety, probably will take me more than two weeks or probably I will give up for now because I, 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 I said I cannot do it. What held me through was that I had to prepare for this sermon and preach to you. And I cannot preach to your message I don't believe in. Because when I say the word of God, I tell you my testimony. I tell you how God loves me and how I see God working in my life. Matthew 6, 31 to 34 says, so, do not start worrying, where will my food come from, or my drink, or my clothes? They're, these are the things the pagans are always concerned about. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all these things. 
Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. So, do not worry about tomorrow. It will have enough worries of its own. There is no need to add to the troubles each day brings. And Romans 14, 17 says, For God's kingdom is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of the righteousness, peace, and joy with the Holy, with the, with the Holy Spirit gives. Don't worry. Don't be so over-concerned about life that your mind gets divided. Because worry is unhealthy. Worry is unbecoming will stop you to become what God wants you to be. I got a car as a present, and worry and anxiety was wanted to stop me to enjoy it. Don't allow, don't allow the spirit of fear to take away the joy that God wants to bless you with. And also, it's unproductive. When you are stressful, when you are worried, you, you are very unproductive. I saw it in, before COVID, uh, I, I, I was training a lot of people. And it's such a joy when you, you take them, they know nothing, and you start to build them up, and you see them, how they perform. And the main thing I focused on it was to take away their level of stress. Because when people are stressed, they are unproductive. As soon as you build their confidence up, you see that they are coming very productive. What they couldn't do in six hours will do for you in an hour now. And this is spiritually as well. Fear will steal from you the word of God, will steal from you the, the, the joy of rejoicing on who we are in Christ. And the solution... But in all your prayers, ask God for what you need. What you need, not what you want. Okay? The Bible said what we need, not what we want. Always asking him with a thankful heart. What Paul is telling us here is to replace anxiety with prayer and our worry with worship. When we focus on the external, we miss the battle on the internal. And what surprises us doesn't surprise God. It came a surprise to us, COVID-19 didn't come a surprise to God. God knows the end from the beginning. So we have to focus on, on, on God and what is going inside of us. Many times we are so concerned about the things that, uh, that we don't have that we forget to be thankful, thankful for the things we do have. We are so concerned to ask God so many things, and we forgot to tell him what we have. You had the ability to come to church today. You have the ability to breathe alone. Are you thankful for all this, or we just take it from, for granted? Because what is more valuable to us than our health eventually? When our health is gone, we just drop everything. Even we sell our house, car, whatever we have to gain back our health. But how much we do thank God for our health on a daily basis. Paul says, let your request be made known. Say exactly what is your, your need. And not because we can inform God. We cannot inform God. He knows what we need. We are confirmed to what God says when we pray. We voice our dependence on him. Through prayer, we talk to God, not because he doesn't know it and needs us to inform him, but because we need to acknowledge for ourselves that only God can do what we cannot do, that he is strong and we are weak. Worry and worship cannot coexist. Can you be sad and happy in the same time? Can you laugh and cry in the same time? Can you have a negative and a positive attitude in the same time? You, those two things cannot coexist. When you worship God, you, you cannot be worried. 
An attitude of gratitude. This is one of uh, Florence's uh, preferred quote. If you ask her what is your attitude, she will tell, tell us she has an attitude of gratitude. It has such a healing effect on our heart. A heart full of worry is empty of worship because worry communicates that you don't trust God for the details. You look to the what-ifs of lives in, instead of looking with what is of God's word. When you replace the what-ifs with what is, you actually replace the uncertainty with certainty. We have to thank God for his care, promises, blessings, presence, faithfulness, love, guidance, encouragement, provision. We have to learn to celebrate the work of God in our life. And if this is the solution, what is the result? And God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your heart and mind safe in union with Christ Jesus. So how, how do we get this peace of God? Now, first, we have to understand that there is a difference between having peace with God and having the peace of God. Because it is faith that brings peace with God when we surrender to God and we gain salvation through Jesus as Savior. So Jesus, our Savior, bring, brings us peace with God. 2 Peter 1-2 said, May grace and peace be yours in full measure through your knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So Jesus, our Savior, will bring us the peace with God, and Jesus as Lord brings the peace of God in our heart, that feeling of confidence that everything will be okay. The peace of God cannot be explained. When people ask me why you are a Christian, how, how is this working, I tell you, you know what? If you don't have your own personal relationship with God, I cannot explain it to you. Because it's beyond words, beyond understanding. It's something inside me, it's something between me and God. It's a personal relationship with God. And what we must understand is that a peace-filled life is only accessible to a prayerful heart. The peace of God is only accessible through the grace of God. So we had another problem, the second problem, which says worry. What do you do when you worry? And Paul is telling us pray, worship, and then you will find the peace of God. God. Going forward, we just have a solution. We don't know exactly what he is addressing here, so I just put it that we address the church as a whole. And said, in conclusion, my friends, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise. Things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Put into practice what you learn and receive from me, both from my words and from my actions. So what Paul tells here, think, practice, and be an example. An average person has about 70,000 thoughts daily, so we better make sure that our minds are open by invitation only. We should focus on few chosen things, not on many random things thrown to us by life. Our thoughts are more than just thoughts. They are what guide us through life and define us. They mold our view of the world and those around us. And you might say, okay, what, what to think about? The Bible consistently demonstrates the relationship between thoughts and actions. What we think is what we eventually believe and will determine how we live. People doings is the result of their thinkings. Because what the mind attends to, the mind considers. What the mind constantly considers, and this is the meditation, you constantly consider something, the mind starts to believe. And what the mind believes, the mind eventually does. 
Proverbs 4.23 says, Be careful how you think your life is shaped by your thoughts. And Romans 8.6 says, To be controlled by human nature results in death. To be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. How can I think according to the Bible? We must think carefully, righteously, and actively. We have to be vigilant of the input you allow to enter your mind. What you see, what you hear, you have to let your Bible govern your life. Now, if you will watch six hours per day uh, TV shows and uh, soap operas or whatever, believe me, it's not the Bible who will guide your life. But if you spend time in prayer, if you spend time in reading your Bible, then what is coming in your thoughts will be the Word of God. I remember I took a holiday a few, a few years ago, about two, three years ago, and I said, you know what, for one week I will do nothing else, but I will just watch some movies. And this is what I did. Believe me, 24-7 I was seeing, re reviewing the movies in my head, was playing again and again and again. I want it or I didn't want it. It's because what you feed yourself with. If you feed yourself with junk food, well, you cannot expect to have vitamins, right? It's what you feed, it's, it's our choice. And Psalm 1979 give us the things that we think we should think and what is the result and says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It gives new strength. The commands of the Lord are trustworthy, thinking, giving wisdom to those who lack it. The laws of the Lord are right and those who obey them are happy. The commands of the Lord are just and give understanding to the mind. Reverence for the Lord is good. It will continue forever. The judgments of the Lord are just. They are always fair. So we have to think and to thank. We have to think and remember what God has done so far and thank God for his provision for the future. And we cannot thank God for what he did so far if we don't dwell in his word, if we don't feed on his word. Because God did it before, he will do it again. But how can the Spirit help us and guide us if we don't have that seed of the word of God? Now again, to think all these thoughts, you have to make them personally for yourself. I will give you some examples how to look at it, but you have to do it personally because this is about a personal relationship. Thinking true words, the word of God, the faithfulness of God, this is true. Noble, how I can better serve in Christian ministry? Thinking right, how can be a better witness for Christ? Thinking pure thoughts, the innocence of the children, or the beauty of God's creation. Admirable. I all the time admire the service of the missionaries. I just admire them, to leave everything behind and just to go and serve God in this way. So I admire them and I pray for them. Excellence. How can you be an excellent person? In which areas of your lives you can improve? How can I teach or study the Bible better? And praiseworthy. New believers who are born again. There are so many things that we can, we can be, give praise to God for. Find your own. Now we thought about it. We have to do it, isn't it? And Bridget started with Romans 12, 1 to 2, uh, call to worship. And I would just want to read it for us again. So then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourself to the standard of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. 
And the result again is, and the God who gives us peace will be with you. God has our best in mind, and he wants our mind at its best. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God's peace defeats what we couldn't defeat in a lifetime. And life cannot exist without the word of God. Why? Because Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. Life cannot exist without light. And life is exhausting and completely void of all peace until you let God in. So we looked at the church as a whole, each one of us as individual. Thinking and acting will take us to God's presence. And I started with a poem. I want to finish with a poem. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day. By deeds that you do, by words that you say. Man, read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? Be aware you can learn something or listen to a sermon, but not really receive it. You know, people said, yes, I can hear you. Yes, I am, I am listening. But not all the time you will pay 100% attention because some people, they listen casually. Okay, it's just another sermon. Some people are listening actively, it's touching them in some areas of their lives. Some people, they even take notes, said, okay, I will, I will think at it again. And some people are thinking, oh, this sermon was too long. Are you done yet? Is your attitude toward the word of God? My advice for you is receive the word of God. Believe the word of God. Act according to the word of God. And the God who gives us peace will be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your teachings, your instructions, your promises. We thank you, Father, that indeed you never leave us nor forsake us. Father, we know that many times we are attacked for different kinds of spirits and we allow them to come in our life. But, Father, we pray that the light of your word which will shine in our life and will live in our hearts so we can be the light of the world you want us to be. Father, we pray for any negative feelings and emotions that we might have. We pray to be uprooted, Father. And instead of that wicked root, Father, the seed of faith in you to take place. Father, I pray for those, Father, who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray, Father, that they will get to have a personal experience with you so they can have peace with you. And I pray, Father, for all of us who are your children, that through Jesus our Lord, we will enjoy peace and joy. May your name be glorified in our life, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we are coming to the end of our service. Um, we are still having one song to um, sing. Uh, you may be seated if you like. It's a meditation uh, worship song uh, based on Philippians 4. So let's just meditate on what we heard and what God's word is saying to us personally. Thank you.
Whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, I will dwell on these. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely. Whatever things are good, I will dwell on me. You remind me of your goodness. You are the God of peace. For we live or we plenty, you survive. Whatever things are just, I will dwell on thee. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good. Yeah.
things are wholesome Whatever brings your peace I will dwell on thee So we've come to um, the end of our service today. We're going to share together our last prayer and afterwards the grace. Let us pray. Our Father, we want to thank you for the gift of life. Lord, you say where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in their midst. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for our church and for the leaders you've given us. Thank you for allowing us to come to this place to feed on your word. Let grace and peace be upon our lives, even as we depart from this place to our different destinations. Let everything we have learned bear fruit in our lives so that your light can shine upon men and they may glorify you as the true living God. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. Let us share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. Have a blessed week. Um, just bear with us. Thank you all.